Cylindra Draconi, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare. Episode 1, The Anachron Campaign. This is a read-through of the book series Cylindra Draconi, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare, as read by the author, D.S. Pope. All character graphics were created by the author from the website heroofmachine.com. Sound effects are downloaded from soundbabble.com. Background music has been composed by Kevin MacLeod at Encompatech.com. I do all of this work for free. My videos are not monetized. If you wish to support my work, please purchase the original book on Amazon Kindle from the link in the description box. Chapter 2 Entertaining Strangers Most people simply cannot abide long and relatively pointless geography lessons. If you happen to be one of those people, you may disregard the next two, perhaps even three minutes of video. Pasha, the Kingdom of Everlasting Peace, was nestled on a small continent in the southern ocean of a world that, just to be fair, your author is not certain even exists. In any case, this continent is largely divided in four quadrants, or the four kingdoms of Pasha as they know it at this point in their history. The southwest quadrant is the Kingdom of Salem, which is also known as Western Pasha, as Pasha and Salem evidently mean the same thing in the ancient language of Mordor. The subjects of this kingdom assure us there is absolutely no confusion between the two. To the north of Western Pasha, also known as Salem, lies the Kingdom of Priva. Between these two kingdoms is a shared border of indeterminate location. Officially, it is defined as a line drawn from the King's Throne at Meridian Castle, which lies at the direct center of the continent, westward to the ocean shore. But in reality, the word reality being one which should have no place in a work of fiction, the border is incredibly murky and ill-defined in any practical sense, as the two kingdoms share a rather large and dense woodland known to the inhabitants as the Peruvian Forest. The forest itself is shared between two rival, and sometimes even warring, elven factions, the Ivy Elves at the northern half, and the Austral Elves, or the Dark Elves, at the southern half. And the border between the two, somewhere in the middle of the forest, was also uncertain and highly contested. The question of who owns the forest has been a subject of much conflict between the two human kingdoms and their elven counterparts, as is the question of who controls the numerous coastal islands. To the east of Pariva is the Empire of Midoriya, or alternately, Viridia, depending on whichever noted tenured professor or user-edited encyclopedia my dear readers choose to consult. The Empire boasts of largely mountainous terrain, ranging from low-lying grassy and fertile hills to the south, to ragged volcanic mountains to the northeast. In a dormant volcano in this area lies the legendary stronghold known as the Presidia, a location which will become more important to my dear readers the very instant it is actually located. Even farther north still, far across the northern sea, on a series of islands so far away that most map makers do not even bother with them, is the Kingdom of Dragonia. Just in case that name is not clear enough, the official maps at least bear an ubiquitous inscription in this general area. Here there be dragons. In another series of islands, this one to the far northeastern edge of the map, rests the province of Mysteria, now known as the Sultanate al Baltana. This will also become important later in this book series. And finally, the southeastern quadrant holds the Kingdom of Eastern Pasha. This, of course, is not to be confused with the Kingdom of Pasha that comprises the continent of Pasha as a whole. The subjects of the kingdom assure us quite emphatically that this causes not the slightest modicum of confusion at all, although my dear readers might be inclined to speak not a few disparaging remarks about the author's creativity with regards to conjuring interesting and unique location names. It almost seems as if this author lives on a country known as America, or alternatively, America, on a continent called North America, which is north of South America, both of which are so named because an explorer named Americo drafted the map. Along the rocky cliffs of the far eastern coastline, we finally come to a rather dark and imposing castle known as Case Farage, or Castlian Agna Farage, Castle by the Sea in Old Entish. Case Farage is an imposing edifice that seemed constantly out of place in time with the rest of the kingdom which, 
at least beyond the outskirts of Anacron City, mostly consisted of farmland and fishing villages. It was in this castle that King Tobias gathered all of the titled noblemen and ladies of the kingdom to share in one of his famed sumptuous feasts, which occurred on regular intervals, specifically every third Thursday in a month of five Sundays. It was within the great hall of the castle that the king brought forth for the enjoyment of his nobility a vast and costly array of delectable items from all over the kingdom. Ripe citrus fruits, honey glazed buttered bread, roasted fowl and fauna of a bewildering variety, large wheels and wedges of cheese, and dozens of different types of beer and wine, or the sorts of foodstuffs one would find at a harvest festival. Draped in the finest white linen, the long wooden tables were cluttered with large platters of food, goblets of wine, and elegant candelabras, so arranged on the table that there was almost no room for the dinner plates of the guests. At these Thursday feasts, the noblemen quite literally ate like kings, much to the disadvantage of the common subjects outside the castle walls. The common people quite often ate like peasants, which was quite appropriate as they were peasants. It was to case for age that our visitors were sent. Bourbons are fabulous creatures. Similar to the animals that my dear readers may refer to as horses, only horned and slightly more bovine than equine, bourbons are rather versatile beasts of burdens. Possessing incredible strength, they can haul a guard knight in steel plate armor into the heaviest of battles, run around all day, and still hardly break a sweat. Many a time a guard knight has died from sheer exhaustion and fallen from his saddle, only to have his bourbon mope about looking for another soldier to carry into battle. To have two of such creatures yoked together in tandem and pulling a heavy burden hardly meets the threshold of physical exertion for them. The burden on the predictor of Thursday in question, the 19th of September 1715, was a dark purple carriage with gilded trim and large wooden wheels of similar colors. In the coach seat was an old elf, his bony hand grasping the reins and a look of concentration on his face as he merely pretended he knew how to drive a bourbon drawn carriage. He wore an ankle length black robe with red trim and black leather boots. His long straight glaring black beard matched his long, straight, graying black hair, which was drawn back by means of a white and black ribbon into what would have been described as a ponytail had such a creature existed on their world. On the top of his head, worn low to shield his eyes from the bright sunlight, he had a wide-brimmed black leather hat that definitely hid his long, pointed ears. It was the type of item that elves normally wore when traveling in a predominantly human kingdom as humans were well known for being quite intolerant of those not of their own kind. In the cabin, the thick purple curtains hiding them from the outside world sat two dragons, though one would not know it when they traveled about in human form. The first dragon was an incredibly dim-witted fellow. He wore his beard long and unkept, with his black woolly hair jutting out from his head in dozens of random directions, as if a comb and his hair had never met in polite company presuming, of course, that he even knew what a comb was or how to use one. He had thick brown leather armor on his chest, a fur cloak over his shoulders, and a large steel mallet between his legs with a long handle resting on his left shoulder. At the present time, he was holding two large wooden blocks to use to keep the carriage wheels in place when it was parked. He was busy tapping these blocks together to mimic the sound of bourbon hooves as they raced down the dirt road. There was only one thought coursing through his adult mind, as two thoughts together would certainly be too much for him. Protect the princess at all costs. The dragoness resplendent in a light blue dress with a matching blue ribbon woven into her long wavy black hair, sat on the cushioned carriage seat, bemused at the thought that inanimate blocks of wood were enough to keep her bodyguard entertained. But then she scoffed at the notion that a sky dragoness such as herself would be sitting inside a human stuffy carriage rolling along the ground when she ought to be free to fly high into the air. An even greater insult to her dignity was that this lowly earth dragon, who did not appear to be smart enough to say the words earth dragon, would be tasked with protecting her. After all, 
As her father, King Jodar, had always taught her, Vasula Pula ought to be powerful enough to protect her subjects, not the other way around. She adjusted herself on the cushioned velvet seats and wondered how the normal human occupants would ever be comfortable sitting on such thin pillows, drinking from goblets of wine and hiding their faces from the warm ways of the world's two sons when they were so gracious to present themselves on what, in this season, would ordinarily be a somewhat cold, gray, and overcast day. Oh, what she would give to be free from the strange rolling contraption, bouncing and jarring with every rock and every hole along the road. As soon as the carriage stopped, she very well imagined, she would burst through the wind doors with her curious purple and gold tapestries, transform into her proper dragon self, fly straight up into the air, and sail high above the clouds. She would bid the two sons a proper greeting with her well-rehearsed aerial acrobatics, dives, somersaults, and hairpin turns. After all, that is the proper way a blue dragoness travels. Bored almost to tears, she opened a short curtain that served as a partition between the cabin and the driver's seat. The afternoon sunlight entered the cabin and reflected off her lovely chocolate-colored skin. The light brightened the purple curtains and gilded artifices surrounding the two riders, but Solyndra took no interest in any of those things. Instead, she turned her attention to the driver. Marcus, she inquired sweetly, hiding her annoyance at the situation. Oh, Marcus? Yes, my child, he answered back, still trying to concentrate so he can actually stay at the center of the road. Solyndra balked. Ugh. She was almost 200 years old. Or was she over 200? She never could keep track of such things. In any case, she was clearly above the age that dragons were considered adults, which occurred sometimes around their first century celebration. And yet Markodar, her father's most trusted royal advisor and the most brilliant historian tactician in three passion kingdoms, still insisted on treating her like a little child. Then again, at more than 500 years old, Markodar was older than her own father, and nearly as old as her grandfather before he was placed into the catacombs. Even still, he would be considered barely middle-aged according to the other race of long livers, his native elves. But none of this changed the fact that she was stuck in a carriage drawn by a pair of bourbons rolling along the ground well within human territory. The entire scenario was beneath her royal dignity, as was the horrible realization that none of them happened to be a half-blind blacksmith. Marcus, she continued, still using his elven name, I'm somewhat confused. Why did we not simply fly to the human's castle? Why must we ride along the ground in this? She cast her eyes at the size of the carriage as she tried to think of the correct term. This contraption. Marco Dorf sighed and answered, Because, my young Welplet, we must travel incognito. If we were to charge into human territory with full Dragonian regalia, then most assuredly our hosts would fire their cannon at us and knock us right out of the air. We must, uh, there now my magnificent bourbon stick on the road, we must appear to be as one of them, or how else are we to infiltrate their castle and deliver our important message? And besides all that, we have seemed to enlisted the services of our friend the Earth Dragon, and he know very well that he cannot fly on his own. So who carries him all the way to Adacron City? You? Or me. Solyndra was considerably underwhelmed by Markadar's explanation of their travel arrangements, or how it was to be better than flying over the top of the humans' heads and casting long, foreboding shadows down upon them. No, there was something else that Markadar said that really put the sand beneath her scales. The very thought of it caused her bright blue luminescent eyes to turn a dark crimson color. The inside of the carriage was bathed in a deep red hue, and even Brutaldar, the brown dragon, stopped his wood-tapping game and tried to stay as quiet and inconspicuous as possible. Well, Pled, Slender thought, how dare you call me that? Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Markadar answered. I did not mean to offend. Well, you did, and I assure you we will continue this conversation later. For the benefit of my dear readers, who I am fairly certain are intelligent enough to already know such minor details, Welplet is a singularly derogatory term. A whelp, of course, is merely a young dragon, older than a hatchling, which is analogous to an infant, but not quite a fully mature dragon. 
While the word whelp is used for both boys and girls equally, the word whelplet applies only to girls, almost always to remind them that they are considered inferior, and that certain activities, games, and even political or social standing will be at least significantly limited or even outright denied to them by mere virtue of their gender. To be certain, tremendous changes occurred during the revolutionary activities of Queen Jadra, and no daughter of hers would consent to return to the old ways. Of course, Markodar was fully aware of Jadra's legendary exploits. In fact, as the royal historian, his book, Dragonian History and Social Stratification during the Reign of His Majesty, the Dracos Tyrannos King Jodar, and his wife King Jadra, 7th edition, with updated maps and detailed information of the Word of Ascension, drawn from recently declassified sources, has been required reading for all university students throughout Pasha. However, this fact is problematic for at least two important reasons, partly because only a small percentage of Pashians ever attended universities, but mostly because those that do never actually read their textbooks. Most of them never get past the title page for some unexplained reason, much to their professor's everlasting chagrin. Further, Markadar only used the word whelplet as a term of endearment. The elves, Ivy and Austral elves equally, typically dispense with gender-defined distinctions. For them, boys and girls are treated the same, and they are limited only by their own intelligence, willpower, and craftiness. Due mostly to such drastic sociological differences between elves and dragons, Markadar has been little more than an outside observer of social life rather than an active participant. This is fairly remarkable, as he happened to be married to Friedra, leader of the Ice Dragons and the younger sister of Jadra. In other words, General Markadar was Slendra's uncle by marriage, as if the reader actually gives half a In the time it took the author to narrate the preceding paragraphs for this video, Markadar had managed to keep the carriage somewhat near the center of the road long enough to approach a wooden bridge, which spanned across a deeper lean with a mighty rushing river. At the foot of this bridge, in the middle of the road so as to block the traveler's path, stood an old man. He had long yellow-white hair and beard and heavy fur coat and long crooked walking stick, none of which appeared to have been within a stone's throw of a bar of soap in quite a long time. Markadar ordered the bourbons to stop, and following some insistent pulling of the reins on his part, the beast finally consented and stopped in the tracks a few inches from the old man's long, thin nose. Finally, Slender exclaimed impatiently as the wooden wheels of the bourbon carriage squeaked and halted. Even before Markadar gave the order to dismount, she burst through the side door of the carriage and threw her feet to the cold, dusty ground. Then, as was her habit, she looked up to the sky to check the weather. She knew that Little Uncle, the smaller and more luminous of the suns, was steadily making his approach towards Old Father, the larger Red Sun. The times that they perfectly crossed paths, which would be in another three months in this case, were occasions of great mirth and gift-giving. This holiday, called Uncle's Passing, or Uncle Pass, was a festive celebration that the humans, elves, and dragons alike all looked forward to. The humans saw the interplay of their sons as a foot race between Old Father and Little Uncle. Sometimes Father was ahead, sometimes Uncle, and at other times they caught up with each other in the same location in the sky. The dragons, of course, knew this to be a silly little story. They knew that father and uncle were orbiting about each other in a binary star system, with the planets in the shared solar system, along with their own world of Gia, orbiting in a generally circular path around them. Yet it was not truly circular, as the relative position of the two stars in relation to the planets caused constant fluctuations in gravitational pull, which moved the paths of the planets outside what would be a circular orbit into a somewhat spirographical orbit, at least as viewed from above. But the elves knew the true story. To quote the Back to the Future movies, they thought fourth dimensionally might fly. The true orbit of the planet G is neither a circle or a spirograph, but something closer to a spiral corkscrew motion as the entire solar system follows the binary stars orbiting about each other in their 225 million year orbit around the great star cluster in the center of the galaxy. And far away, at the direct opposite end of the same galaxy, there was a small lonely planet, 
which, much like Gia, is a watercolor terrestrial planet with a viable atmosphere that is comprised mostly of nitrogen with a 20% oxygen admixture falling within a habitable zone of a singular yellow star. This planet, one of eight and a half planets, sorry Pluto, all travel in their own respective spiral orbits as they follow their star in its orbit in the outer arm of the galaxy. And even the elves were floored when they read the work of the esteemed astrologist from that world, Dr. Phil Plate, who made the rather absurd assertion that everything written in this paragraph was completely bloody wrong. Honestly, the author ought to be ashamed of himself. Of course, my dear readers would be duly warned not to ridicule the inhabitants of Earth for having their one solitary sun <laughs> to lead the procession of eight and one-half planets obediently following, for the planet known as Earth also has a massive natural satellite that reflects the light of their sun and fills their night sky. This satellite, which they call a moon, is so spectacular that poets write of it, troubadours sing of it, and women swoon at the sight of it. Even the werewolves of their distant world cry out mournfully whenever they see the light of the moon for two very important and undeniable reasons. First, because they are fictional characters in poorly written fantasy books, and second, because the playful antics of Slendra and her dear departed husband Silphardar before he tragically fell at the hands of the centaurs at the Battle of Very Green Hill is a better written work of fantasy fiction than anything ever written about them. Compared to this one moon, Slendra and her Jian cohabitants enjoyed the company of three moons, but the largest of them was not nearly as big, the smaller one was not nearly as bright, and the even smaller one was not worth mentioning in polite company. In the time it took the reader to digest the preceding digression, Solyndra had scanned the sky in a desperate attempt to locate Old Father and Little Uncle. However, they had conspired to play a cruel trick on the dragoness and hid themselves behind thick clouds, which dampened their brilliance and cast a blanket of darkness over the traveler's general vicinity. Groaning in frustration, <sighs> she lowered her eyes and looked upon the old man who was blocking their path. What is all this then? She demanded of no one in particular. Markadar looked the old man up and down and stated, I have no idea, but he is in our way and we need to discover a method of removing him. Indeed. Hello, my good sir, Markadar called out to the man with a wave of his hand. The old man, in response to the salutation, did not budge from his present location, but leaned on his staff and bowed politely. Hello, my friend. Might I have your name? Marcus Pylinskius, at your humble service, he replied regally. Pi, it ought to be noted, was not the first letter of an actual middle name, as may be presumed. His parents, in a desperate attempt to make him look more intelligent, assigned Pi as his middle name, as it is a literary representation of an irrational number that is the ratio of a circumference of a circle to its diameter. Markildar then bowed elegantly to the old man, though he took much care not to remove his wide-brimmed leather hat, as that would reveal his long-pointed elven ears. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Marcus, the man answered without the smallest hint of reality. And what might your name be, my friend? The old man shrugged slightly and answered, Why do you need to know my name? You'll not be alive long enough to tell it to anybody. My lads will see to that, won't they? Now, boys, <laughs> suddenly and completely without warning, the old man found his neck within the muscular grasp of Brutodar's massive fist. Must protect princess, he bellowed loudly as he gripped the man's throat like a vice. In one swift movement, Markadar sent a fireball towards the side of the carriage. It singed the coat of the old man's oldest son, who was presently raided in the carriage. Likewise, Slindra sent a lightning spell towards the other raider on her side. This trapped the man and gave him painful shock every time he tried to move. Seeing that he had no means of escape, he dropped the box he was carrying, which broke into pieces once it hit the gravel road beneath his feet. A sack of flour spilled on the ground and a handful of apples rolled underneath the carriage. Please, madam, the man begged, I'm only trying to feed my family. Slender gave a sympathetic look as he examined the rider and the box of food stuff they dropped on the ground. She sighed deeply, stopped the lightning spell, and instructed the man to take the box with him. I was once caught stealing, she told Kennedy, 
The man I stole from was very generous to me and allowed me to make proper restitution. Yes, ma'am, he answered. Go on now, go feed your family. And my father, madam? He asked and pointed at the old man whose throat was still clamped in Budodar's tight fist. Release that man, Budas, she ordered. Put him down, Markodar emphatically instructed. Budodar reluctantly set the man back down on the ground. Between coughing painfully and gasping for air, <coughs> he fell into the arms of his older son as he moved themselves out of the path of the carriage. Might I suggest we not do that anymore? His younger son asked him as he grabbed the food box and walked to the side of the road. There they watched as the travelers, who were much stronger than the raiders had initially suspected, climbed back into the carriage and continued their journey to the castle. At least make sure the travelers don't know magic, the older son suggested. That concludes this segment of Slender Dragon Eye, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare. In the next edition, we find out what happens when castle guards do not stand a proper watch. If you wish to support me in my work, please purchase the original book from Amazon Kindle from the link in the description box.